Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is inflammatory bullous disorders. I'm going to begin by discussing a general presentation of blistering diseases. Then I'm going to compare and contrast uh, two diseases with similar names, but which are very different, pemphigus and bullous pemphigoid. And I'm going to finish up with a discussion of dermatitis herpetiformis. So when we think about blisters, you all know that you can see blisters in a variety of different disease states. So herpes virus infection, thermal burns, erythema multiforme, trauma, um, uh, poison ivy. But when we talk about the bullous diseases, we're referring to diseases in which blisters are the primary manifestation and they may be life-threatening. And this video in particular is going to be focusing just on the inflammatory bullous diseases because there are also non-inflammatory uh, hereditary uh, blistering diseases. Now, when you think about a blister, probably something you haven't thought about very much is where in the skin is the blister actually forming? Uh, so there are three locations and we're going to talk about them and I'm going to go through the pathophysiology of these diseases so you don't need to memorize the different locations. You will understand it because you'll understand the disease process. So the three locations where blisters can arise will be subcorneal. So we have here uh, our skin with our epidermis here and beneath the, uh, the uh, corneal layer, we have uh, our blister. Another possibility is a supra uh, basal uh, blister, and this is above the basal cell layer uh, in the epidermis. And then finally, you can have a, a sub-epidermal, so the entire epidermis uh, lifts up. So let's talk about why this happens in these different diseases. So this is an image from uh, Robbins and Cotran, uh, Pathologic Basis of Disease. And it's a busy slide, but I think there's a lot of information that will help you to understand the pathophysiology. So let's look here uh, at a, a schematic of skin. We have our stratum corneum, our stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, basal cell layer, and the underlying basement membrane. Now, as you'll recall, the keratinocytes are attached to each other by desmosomes that hold them together very tightly. And in fact, when you see uh, edema in the skin, uh, there'll be a space between keratinocytes. And if you look closely, you can see the little bridges between individual keratinocytes where the desmosomes are still attached. We also have our hemidesmosomes, which are what attach the basal cell layer to the basement membrane. Now, the desmosome is composed of a number of different proteins, but for the, for, the, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to focus simply on one called desmoglion. And specifically, there are two different types of desmoglion uh, that we need to think about in the skin. One is called desmoglion 1, and it's distributed throughout the entire epidermis, um, so predominantly at the top with somewhat lower levels uh, as you uh, go deeper into the epidermis. And the other is desmoglion 3, which is uh, mostly here in the lower areas of the uh, epidermis. Now, as you would uh, imagine, if you had an antibody directed against this particular uh, protein, which is going to cause uh, inflammation, uh, an inflammatory attack here that's going to break apart uh, your uh, desmosome, that the entire uh, epidermis is going to have breaking apart of these keratinocyte to keratinocyte junctions, what is called acantholysis. If, on the other hand, you had something that was just affecting desmoglion 3, then you would expect that only in the lower part uh, of the epidermis would you see uh, breaking apart uh, of the desmosomes. And as we talk about the hemidesmosomes, which we'll talk about when we talk about bullous pemphigoid, we'll be looking at the BPAG2 uh, protein, also known as collagen 17. All right, let's go on to pemphigus. So there are several different types of pemphigus. We're only going to focus on two of them in this lecture. One is called pemphigus vulgaris, the other pemphigus foliaceus. Now pemphigus vulgaris is suprabasal blisters, right? So it's going to occur right here, right above that basal layer. Uh, and it's due to antibodies, autoantibodies to desmoglion 3 or desmoglion 1 and 3. So you're either going to be wiping out all of these or you're going to be just wiping out these. And that's why we see this suprabasal uh, appearance. This is where the blister is going to ap appear. Now, these blisters rupture very easily, and patients will either have mucosal pemphigus vulgaris or mucosal and cutaneous pemphigus vulgaris. They don't have just cutaneous pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, 
Now we contrast that to Pempigus foliaceus, which has several differences. One is its cutaneous involvement only. It does not tend to involve the mucous membranes. This probably has something to do with the distribution of desmoglein 1 and 3 um, based on uh, skin versus uh, mucosal membranes. The blisters will be subcorneal, so they're going to be much more superficial. And in fact, while uh, the blisters in Pempigus vulgaris look like the typical blister that uh, you would expect to see uh, with uh, an erythematous surface, uh, in Pempigus foliaceus, they're so superficial that you might just see a serous crust. Uh, and what this is due to is an antibody to desmoglein 1 only. So you can see here, if you're thinking about it, you're going to have predominantly uh, lysis of our uh, desmosomes in the upper portion, hence our subcorneal blister. Uh, one thing uh, to know about these diseases is that they do have a global distribution. However, Pemphigus foliaceus is endemic in Brazil. It's thought to be an intersection of environmental and genetic uh, background. All right, let's take a look at Pemphigus vulgaris, remember suprabasal blisters. And there, here you can see this has been uh, unroofed. Uh, it's a fairly extensive blister, erythematous, and uh, as you would expect, this patient uh, is at risk for infection. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, these individuals can also have uh, mucosal uh, erosions, which you can see here. That's not something you would see in Pemphigus uh, foliaceus. Uh, now, remember, Pemphigus foliaceus is, again, our subcorneal blister. As you see here, we don't really see that raw erythematous base that we saw uh, for Pemphigus uh, vulgaris. Instead, there's a, a serous crust. Uh, and in patients uh, with lightly pigmented skin, it may appear erythematous. By contrast, in individuals with darker pigmented skin, uh, the lesions may appear uh, hyperpigmented. All right, let's look at the histology of these two, right? So it's perfect. Here we have this beautiful cartoon, and look, here's the histology. So um, just test yourself which is which. This is going to be Pemphigus vulgaris with our suprabasal blister. You can see the, uh, the basal cells are, are still attached. And here in this inset, you can see that they're rounding up. So remember, the desmosomes have broken down because you have this autoantibody. It's going to cause inflammation. Uh, when that desmosome breaks apart, the cell will now round up and form what they call these little tombstones. So this is an acantholytic blister. Now, by contrast, uh, when we look at uh, Pemphigus foliaceus with our subcorneal blister, here we have this uh, beautiful uh, little shallow uh, blister here. And then we can bring this all home, put the story together with direct immunofluorescent staining for immunoglobulin. Here we have Pemphigus vulgaris. So remember, we have uh, autoantibodies that are going to go the full thickness. So this is a full thickness uh, skin biopsy. You can see uh, each of these keratinocytes is outlined uh, in green where the immunoglobulin is, is binding. Uh, and because we have uh, desmoglein 1 going all the way through and desmoglein 3 at the bottom, we have full thickness uh, staining. And here you can see that uh, suprabasal blister, so right at the bottom with uh, some acantholysis. By contrast, here's our pemphigus foliaceus, where we have once more that subcorneal blister, and most of the staining is going to be in the upper uh, half to uh, upper third with loss of staining as we get down to the lower layers. That correlates uh, with our understanding of pemphigus foliaceus, which as you recall is desmoglein 1. All right, so how do we treat these patients? We give them immunosuppressive medications, which will decrease the titers of these pathogenic antibodies. All right, let's move to the next disease, which has a similar name, bolus pemphigoid, totally different presentation, also autoimmune. Now, these uh, patients tend to be elderly, so greater than 60 years old, and they get these tense bullae that are filled with clear fluid on the inner thighs, flexor surfaces of the forearms, axilla, uh, groin, and lower abdomen. Uh, the uh, bullae tend to be less than two centimeters, but they can be as large as four to five centimeters. And unlike what we see in Pemphigus vulgaris, they do not rupture easily, so they're quite tense. And part of the reason, if you think about it, is because these are sub-epidermal blisters. So they have that full thickness of the epidermis, which is covering them. And they're non-acantholytic. Why is that? You see acantholysis when we have something that's attacking our desmosomes. This is going to be attacking our hemidesmosomes. All right, so let's look at the pathophysiology. In bolus pemphigoid, you have autoantibodies that are going to bind to the proteins that keep the basal keratinocytes adherent to the base basement membrane. And what we see is, uh, if we look at this with immunofluorescence, is linear staining at the dermal epidermal junction where the hemidesmosomes are.
Now, there are two antigens that we think about when we think about bullous pemphigoid. The one that you want to put at the top of your list is BPAG2, bullous pemphigoid antigen 2, also known, as I mentioned, as type 17 collagen or BP180. And we see this in about 80 to 90 percent of patients who have bullous pemphigoid, and um, antibody titers will correlate with disease activity. Now, there is a second antigen, bullous pemphigoid antigen 1, BP230. We see this in about 60 to 70 percent of patients, but it's not clear whether this is actually part of the pathophysiology or whether it is a secondary phenomenon. So let's look here. We have the uh, lamina lucida and lamina densa of the basement membrane. BPAG2 is our uh, transmembrane protein. And if you were to get uh, an attack, an uh, inflammatory attack here where this breaks apart, then that uh, basement, uh, uh, that basal cell is going to just detach, leaving uh, the basement membrane behind. So that's what we see here histologically, is we have this uh, sub-epidermal uh, blister. So the entire epidermis is lifted up. And you can see how thick the epidermis is here. You can see why perhaps these don't rupture as easily as the ones that we saw that were superbasilar or uh, subcorneal. Now, what happens is, is these uh, antibodies are going to bind to the hemidesmosomes and activate complement, which are going to recruit uh, neutrophils and eosinophils, resulting in inflammation and disrupting of our uh, epidermal attachments. So uh, these patients, um, uh, this particular disease is potentially fatal, uh, but it's predominantly due to comorbidities and uh, effects from the immunosuppressant uh, medication. Uh, the disease itself has a chronic uh, relapsing quality to it, although some patients might go into remission after uh, several years. Uh, the um, uh, standard therapy will be immunosuppressive therapy with corticosteroids. Uh, if it's very aggressive disease, um, more significant immunosuppression may be necessary. So this brings us to our final disease, uh, which is dermatitis herpetiformis. So this is an autoimmune blistering disorder, uh, which is associated with gluten enteropathy. So what is gluten enteropathy? Remember that celiac disease. Now, if you look at Robbins, it will say that uh, more than 80% of individuals with dermatitis or pediformis have celiac disease. Here I've got greater than 90%. The reason is that if you do an intest small intestinal biopsy on individuals with dermatitis or pediformis, more than 90% of them will show gluten enteropathy, but they may not have full on celiac celiac disease. Uh, so the clinical will be uh, bilateral symmetric grouped lesions of the extensor surfaces, elbows, knees, upper back, and buttocks. You can see here uh, these slightly erythematous uh, lesions here symmetrically uh, on the uh, elbows of this individual with lightly pigmented skin and these more hyperpigmented lesions in an individual with darker skin. Okay, so I mentioned that more than 90% of uh, individuals with dermatitis or pediformis have uh, gluten enteropathy, but keep in mind that that does not mean that everyone with gluten enteropathy or celiac disease gets dermatitis or pediformis, which is somewhat less common. Uh, it's an uncommon disease uh, and tends to uh, appear in an older population. But I need to uh, go over uh, celiac disease because we have to understand gluten enteropathy in order to get down to uh, dermatitis or pediformis. So uh, remember what we do is if we eat gluten, uh, then this is digested to form gliadin. Gliadin is then absorbed by the intestinal mucosa. And then tissue transglutaminase will deaminate gliadin, which enables it to bind uh, quite well to HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8. So these two haplotypes are associated with both celiac disease as well as dermatitis or pediformis. Once uh, we have gliadin peptides, which are bound to these HLA uh, molecules, they're recognized by CD4 positive T cells, generate an inflammatory response. Now, something else that can happen is that tissue transglutaminase can covalently cross-link to gliadin and autoantibodies can form to that complex. So why do we see dermatitis or pediformis in individuals with celiac disease, but we don't always see uh, dermatitis or pediformis in uh, everyone who has celiac disease? And why does uh, dermatitis or pediformis show up later? It's thought this could be due to epitope spreading. So what happens is you have initial uh, IgA antibodies to tissue transglutaminase, and then through uh, epitope spreading, you get uh, antibodies to a similar protein called epidermal transglutaminase, which is located where? in the epidermis. Now, histologically, what we're going to see are neutrophilic microabscesses at the tips of the dermal papillae, uh, forming, again, a subepidermal blister. And if we do direct immunofluorescence, we're going to see direct uh, granular uh, deposits of IgA.
So here uh, you can see uh, the immunofluorescence uh, right here, this granular appearance uh, of, of the IgA. Uh, and then here you have this uh, just classic appearance of a um, neutrophilic microabscess at the tip of this papilla. So that is going to be uh, really pathognomonic uh, for dermatitis herpetiformis. Okay, so how do we treat these patients? Uh, same thing we do for celiac disease. You put them on a gluten-free diet. Uh, another possibility is medication with Dapsone, which is an antibacterial sulfone, which is also used in leprosy. I'm going to finish up as usual with a few questions. I'd really like you to go through a compare and contrast of uh, where in the skin do the blisters form in these four diseases, and how does the pathophysiology of each disease reflect it in the location of the blistering in the skin? So thank you very much for your time. I hope you have found this uh, helpful.